So where did we leave off last time? Let's review a little bit. It's been a whole weekend to forget. Uh, right, so if we show that if F is holomorphic on a region that contains a closed disk, um, then for all Z in the disk and for all N, including zero, if we take the nth derivative of f and evaluate it at c, we can evaluate that by taking f of w, w in the circle. The circle, of course, is the boundary of the disk. There's a factor of n factorial over 2 pi i. And then the magic function w minus z, the universal function w minus z to the n plus 1, which will pick off any function whatsoever. This is like a Fourier transform. It's a type of, in fact, it's, OK, we'll get to. Uh, the sense in which this is exactly a Fourier transform. Um, right, and an immediate corollary of this was the Cauchy inequalities. Cauchy inequalities, you just read it off from, from the formula uh, that the nth derivative of z, under all the same conditions that I won't rewrite, is bounded by, let's see, we have this factor n factorial. This thing is of size r, so, where r, so, okay, I do need to say something. If a disk of radius r about z is contained in omega, and in fact, it's closure. If there's a disk of radius r, uh, then we get a factor of r to the n plus one, but the plus one and the length being two pi r is canceled, and we just get this bound times the soup of the integrand on the boundary. That was the Cauchy inequality from Cauchy's inequality. Any questions so far? This is all review. From Cauchy's inequality, we proved Liouville's theorem. Liouville's theorem, F is entire and bounded, implies F is a constant. This, this is not F is a circle, F is a constant. And of course, the proof is to take n equals 1, you get 1 over r, send r to infinity, the derivative is 0 everywhere. So the function is constant. And from that, we concluded the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. If you have a polynomial, then f has f is some a times z minus a1 through z minus a n. Okay, fundamental theorem of arithmetic follows from taking one over f. If it doesn't vanish, then it's constant because it goes to zero at, in, at infinity. Arithmetic or algebra? <sighs> Wrong A. Thank you. <laughs> algebra. Fundamental theorem of algebra. Fundamental, fundamental theorem of arithmetic, we get to a number theory class. Every number is the product of primes uniquely, and, and same was true with uh, ideals in number fields. Okay, in rings. Um, okay. All of this, all of this followed. We got all of these applications, all these miraculous applications from the baby version, baby Kashi, AKA Gersat. That is, if F is holomorphic on, well, a region that contains a triangle, I guess the interior of a triangle. Huh, I can't believe I didn't think of that notation sooner. On a closed, if f is holomorphic on a region that contains a closed triangle, then the integral over the triangle, the boundary of f is zero. All of that followed from that one simple little zooming in. Remember the proof of this? We zoomed in on the triangle and took the worst triangle every time we got four more. And, uh, and then we just used uh, continuity, once we were zoomed in. We use continuity as we, as we zoomed in farther. So uh, there's a beautiful converse to this. Converse to Gersat. Gersat converse, which is Morera's theorem. If you have a function from a region to C, which is continuous. 
And for every closed triangle uh, contained in omega, omega is open. All I know about it is open. Let's say open and connected from, there's, if it's disconnected, then you just do things on the different connected components. But it's open and connected. And for every triangle in omega, the integral over the boundary of that triangle of f is equal to zero, then in fact, f is not just continuous, but differentiable. That is holomorphic, complex differentiable. Okay. And the proof, again, is rather trivial. Do you want a second to think about it? Do you want a minute, a minute to think about it? Take a minute and think about it. You have all the tools, you have too many tools at your disposal. You have an abundance. You have an embarrassment of riches of tools. How could you prove that F is holomorphic? Think back to the proof of Gersat. Um, not to the proof of Gersat. To the proof that once you have, uh, I can't really give you a hint without giving it all away. Well, I'll give you a hint and maybe it'll give it all away. What we proved right after we proved Gersat is that functions on a disk, holomorphic functions on a disk have primitives. So what should we try to prove? Mitchell, I see you've unmuted. You could try to prove that it has a, a primitive and then yeah. you could differentiate twice. And then... Yeah. Uh, let D be some disk in omega. Open disk now. Claim is that F has a primitive in D. What would happen if it had a primitive? Why would that mean that F is holomorphic? Bless you. Awesome. Um, uh, so for primitive would be holomorphic, right? Trivially. So then it would be analytic, I guess. So you can just take its derivative as much as you want. Exactly, exactly. If, if so, if so, here's the funny thing. You start with F, you go up to a primitive, the primitive, the derivative of the primitive is back to F, but that primitive is infinitely differentiable. Isn't that a funny trick? If you want to prove that something's differentiable, you prove it has an antiderivative. And that nuts? We're going the wrong way. You prove that it has a primitive. The primitive is differentiable, infinitely so. So it's twice differentiable. So the original function is differentiable. Pretty nuts, huh? You like that? All right. So why is it? Why is why does f have have a primitive? So remember, we have this disk d wherever it is. We have some point z. We may as well take the center z naught, and we can pay, we can make these curves gamma z. And so let's okay. Let's, uh, I guess I can say, let gamma sub z be given by this picture and let capital F of z be the integral over gamma z f of w dw. And now the argument is familiar. Claim f prime is equal to f. Uh, so look at, look at, f of z plus h minus f of z. Triangles, actually, why don't we do the, uh, let, let's do it, quote unquote, the right way now. Let's just define it to be straight lines. 
So if this is z plus h, wherever z plus h is, we have that curve and that curve, but together with that curve forms a triangle. And integrals over triangles, by assumption, we have assumed, we have assumed that integrals over any triangles are zero. So by assumption, the integral over this triangle is zero. And so this is just the integral as uh, on this curve from z to z plus h on that straight line, that little tiny segment, f of w dw. Now f is continuous, f continuous means that in that tiny neighborhood, we can replace f of w by f of z with an error that goes to zero as w goes to z. Whatever that error is, I don't know what it is. And so we get an integral from z to z plus h. f of w, I'm replacing by f of z dw plus the same integral z to z plus h. Now, little o, as w goes to z, so the point is, as h goes to 0, w goes to z. So I can say little o as h goes to 0 of 1 dw. As h goes to 0, w goes to z, and hence this thing goes to 0. So something that goes to 0 as h goes to 0 dominates something that goes to 0 as w goes to z. Hopefully we've, we've gotten some practice. Did you guys end up using little o notation for your solutions to uh, the homework? Getting some practice with it. I'll I'll uh, I'll check on the homework. See how see how it went. Are you are we uh, do we have any questions on on this? We've been doing this a lot. Maybe we're starting to get used to it. Okay, so h goes to zero implies. So h goes to zero implies that w goes to z. So I can replace little o of h goes to zero. Little o of h goes to zero dominates little o of w goes to z. Okay, what is this integral? f of z is a constant. It has a primitive, which is w. We evaluate w at z plus h, subtract off w at w equals z. And we get Have I lost you? f of z times h? Exactly, times h. Does everybody see that? We're just integrating dw from z to z plus h. So it's just the length, h. OK, how about here? Well, this is little o as h goes to 1 of the length. And the length is h, well, absolute value of h. And so when we divide both sides by h, so 1 over h, f uh, of f of z plus h minus f of z is equal to f of z plus little o as h goes to 0 of absolute value of h over absolute value of h, also known as 1. So this thing goes to 0 as h goes to 0. So the derivative exists and is equal to f. And because big F, once it's once differentiable, is twice differentiable, that means little f is once differentiable. And it's something you don't like. No, it's all good. It's all good? Could so you, yeah, Mitchell? Could you maybe say again, uh, where, like where you're using the, um, the integral of the triangle is zero? Yes, it's right here. It's right here. The original definition, the definition of this is integrate from z0 to z plus h on the straight line. The definition okay. of this is integrate from z0 to z on the straight line. Okay, okay, so the difference is zero because that's the integral of the triangle. The difference is zero because the difference is a triangle. Okay. And what's left is this, this length from z to z plus h. Okay. 
So what do you mean when you say that a little o of h goes to zero dominates little o of w goes to zero? So, so this term is something that goes to zero as w goes to z. Okay. But as h goes to zero, however it is that h is converging to zero, that's restricting to where w is, the, dis the distance from w to z. So h going to zero means w to z, w goes to z. Okay. And so what this symbol means is as h goes to zero, the thing here goes to zero. Okay. And that implies that w goes to z, which means this goes to zero. So whenever you have an implication, I guess let's try to spell this out. Here's a lemma. Here's a lemma that you should try to prove. Um, a goes to b implies c goes to d means little o of c goes to d of anything is bounded by little o as a goes to b of that same quantity. Okay, so something that goes to zero is faster than x as c goes to d. If a goes to b implies c goes to d, then it's also little o of a going to b of x. I don't know if these kinds of abstractions actually help or hurt your understanding. It's good. But if you write this out with epsilons or, or whatever else you, you prefer, this is a good exercise. Let's call this exercise. If you're having, if you're having trouble with these kinds of arguments, you see, what I, why am I doing that? I want to get rid of W. This, this continuity is as W goes to Z, but I want to get rid of W. I just want to think in terms of H. So substitute W going to Z with H going to zero, since H goes to zero implies W goes to Z. And now I have a more uniform uh, factor going to zero. You can do all of this with epsilons. And I think the book does all of this, doesn't use this little o language at all. I think it does use big O, but not little o. But I find it so much more pleasant to not have to introduce epsilons more than we have to. But uh, if this implies that um, one is less than equal to the other, shouldn't we replace the equality by less than equal to? Ah, um, <laughs> yeah, that's also how, so this, these symbols, you have to remove your, uh, you have to give up your understanding of, of the equal sign once you start using little o and big O. So um, what this means is that anytime you have this symbol, you can replace it by this symbol okay. and the expression will still be dominated by the same, the same thing. Okay. Um, yeah, this is probably why uh, they, they wait until slightly later to introduce big O and little o symbols. But things like, uh, you know, X is equal to big O of Y. Um, you can't write big O of Y is equal to X. It's not a symmetric symbol any longer. Okay. Um, yeah. This gets a little funny. I, I want you to pick it up by osmosis. It's the kind of thing that if you formalize the way, the way this is formalizing things, um, I don't know, maybe it's just my personality. I don't like abstract nonsense. I want to understand what things are, how things work by using them a million times through exposure. So that's okay. what I'm trying somehow to, to accomplish, but perhaps failing, you'll, you'll tell me. Okay. So that's Moreira's theorem, the converse to, in other words, a continuous function, a continuous function is holomorphic if and only if it integrates uh, to zero on any triangle where the interior of the triangle is contained in your open region. I mean, the interior and the closure of the triangle is contained in your region of definition. Okay, make sense? All right, um, we have a bunch of applications to do. I'm trying to think of a good order to do them. Do I even want to do this now? Yeah, let's do it now. I'm going to do one application, but I think I'm going to save the rest for my plan, just to give you a kind of a global overview. We're going to get into residue calculus next, 
And then um, the book goes into the gamma functions and the zeta function. I like to save those until after we've gone through the Riemann mapping theorem. So my plan is to jump to chapter eight, Riemann mapping theorem, come back to the zeta function. And when we get to the zeta function, that's when I'll want all of these applications uh, in terms of our limits of holomorphic functions, uh, holomorphic and things like this. So we're gonna need all of that kind of stuff, but I don't wanna do it now and then forget about it for a month and then come back to it. So I'll save it for now, but I will do one, one application because it's an immediate application of Moreira's theorem and, and we, just, we just proved Moreira's theorem. So here's an immediate application. Whoops, immediate application. It's a very beautiful theorem. Um, what do you guys know about the Weierstrass approximation theorem? First, let's, let's look over R. Over R, you have something called the Weierstrass approximation theorem. Does anybody know what it says? Is this something you've covered yet? So any continuous function on a compact set can be uniformly approximated by a polynomial? Yes, exactly. If you have a continuous function on a compact set like zero one closed or any compact, what's important about this is that it's compact. For any function that's just continuous, all I know about it is continuous, real value continuous function is every, um, let's not use symbols, every, every continuous function on compact set is uniformly approximated by not just analytic functions, but analytic functions with finitely many terms, also known as polynomials. You can uniformly approximate a function as bad as you want, like the Cantor function or whatever, as long as it's continuous, doesn't need to be, well, the Cantor function is differentiable almost everywhere. Uh, its derivative is zero almost everywhere. That's what makes it so crazy, and yet it rises. Um, you can, uh, let's, let's say, so over R, you know, uh, Brownian motion, is uh, continuous. Um, almost every uh, Wiener process is, is continuous. Uh, this function on zero to one, some Brownian motion over R, this is uniformly approximable by polynomials the simplest kind of functions, polynomials, okay? This cannot happen over complex variables. So theorem, uh, let Fn be holomorphic. Now this is open and connected. And let Fn converge, suppose Fn converges to F uniformly on compacta. Uniformly on compacta. In other words, i.e., let's spell this out explicitly, for every compact subset, compact subset of omega, what does it mean to uniformly approximate? For all epsilon, there exists an n so that for all n bigger than n and for all z in k, fn of z minus f of z, we have this limiting function, is less than epsilon. So here's your region omega, whatever it looks like. You give me any compact set k, and I'll tell you how far you have to go until every single point is within epsilon of the value of the limiting function. It's extremely, an extremely strong condition. Um, uh, where's our conclusion? Then, all I know about F is that it exists. There's, there's a limiting function. Then, F, the limiting function, is polymorphic.
extremely strong. If you have a sequence of holomorphic functions converging uniformly on compacta to some, some function, if those values are pointwise converging and uniformly on compacta, then the function that they converge to is holomorphic. Now, if there was any justice in the world, you would have to, you know, this, you start opening up these big definitions. This was real analysis. We would have to roll up our sleeves and spend a half hour doing some, some heavy computations and replacing epsilons with deltas and ends and, and all this stuff. But this is complex analysis. We're up in heaven. So how do you prove this in one line? Make a primitive? Um, oh, that's a very good guess. In fact, we will make a primitive, but we've already made that primitive. I called this an application of the previous theorem. So it suffices to apply Morera's theorem to. Let's use Morera. Let's use Morera. Why is this an application of Morera? Proof. This is going to be trivial. Let D be a disk and let t let t be in the disk then the integral of each of the fn's is zero by gersat which means the integral of f over the triangle is zero. Uh, why is f continuous? This you proved in real analysis, presumably. The, the limit of uniformly continuous functions is continuous. This is an easy fact. Uh, uniform, uniformly continuous limit is continuous. So we have a continuous function. The integral over any triangle is zero. Therefore, now by Morera, holomorphic. You like that? No hard work. No hard work. All right, um, yeah, let me not do further applications. Let's get straight to uh, singularities and all such good stuff. Any questions so far? So this, we're using Gersat and Morera together in the same breath. Gersat forwards by holomorphicity. Uniform continuity tells us that the integral converges to the same thing. And Morera takes us backwards to holomorphicity. Ishan. Um, isn't it true that not every compact set contains a disk? So it's definitely true that not every compact set contains a disk. What I'm using is the triangle inside the disk. Even that, right? If you just took the unit circle, where's the I'm using this the... as my K. I'm saying take any, so you have a disk. And now take any triangle okay. inside that disk. So it's not, this is not exactly the wire stress. This isn't the generalization of wire stress. Um, what, we've, what we've shown is that the function is holomorphic on every disk. Right. On every disk inside omega. And omega is open, so it's the union of open disks in it. So I assume that this is like a contradiction to wire stress, like complex continuous functions cannot be approximated by complex polynomials. Yes. Yes, this is in, in great contradistinction. Complex 
Well, uh, complex continuous functions cannot be approximated by polynomials. If they're not holomorphic. If, yeah, without being, without further being holomorphic. Continuity is not sufficient to be approximable by polynomials. Let's spell that out. IE over C over the complexes, continuity is not sufficient to be approximable by not only polynomials, but analytic functions. If you take, give, give me even better uh, family of functions to try to approximate things by uniformly. Polynomials and analytic functions. Does that make sense? The thing that's confusing me is that if you work on the unit disk, yes, or sorry, the unit circle, right? So just uh, magnitude z equals one, right? Doesn't uh, a sum of z n's act like a Fourier series? What I'm saying is, I want to know that if for every compact subset of omega, not for some compact subset, for every compact subset, I have uniform convergence. I get to choose the compact subset. Sean, we want our f sub n's to be holomorphic, which means they have to at least be defined on some open set. They're, they're holomorphic on an open set. So, so we have an open set for free to begin with, which means we have disks. So then why isn't the like, uh, some of z sub n's on the unit disk or on the unit circle. Like, I know that Fourier series can approximate pretty much any function, or not pretty yes. much any function, but like, um, is it not true that uh, sums of z, is it not true that z sub n, z to the n doesn't act like uh, a Fourier so, series on the unit circle? We're, so there's a difference between understanding the function on the disk and understanding it on the interior of the disk. On the interior, we're, we're speaking about holomorphic functions. On the boundary, we're speaking about Fourier analysis on the circle, which we will get to from this point of view. That's coming. Okay, so the like, uh, the more clear statement is not that it's true for any compact set. It's that for any um, compact set, which is a closure, some open set, or something, some other thing where it's not. Uh, no, but it's not that you give me a compact set and I have to deal with it. The assumption is that this, this convergence is uniform on all compacta, not on some compacta, not only along your, your preferred choice of circles. I get to choose the compact sets. Is, ask your question again. It's um, uh, wh why, so this isn't like a generalized, this is a slightly generalized Weierstrass theorem, which holds for fewer compact sets than before. You're saying in Weierstrass, okay, you're I see, I see, you're connecting to Weierstrass. In Weierstrass, you gave me one compact set. And I was forced to deal with whatever compact set you gave me. Yes. yes. Okay, I, I take it, I'll take it. Uh, I'm choosing the compact sets here. In that sense, it's not a great analogy to Weierstrass. I see your point. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry. No worries, no, no, it's, we're, we're here to talk. Uh, if we just wanted to, you know, I could record these lectures and you could watch them on your own later. No, no, we're here for the conversation. So please, please ask your questions. That's why, that's why we, that's why this exists, right? Okay, any other questions? So far, so good. Sorry, Hannah, are you, are you saying something? No, okay. All right, let's move on to singularities. Unless I wanted to say something else first. No, singularities. Singularities. All right. So if I write, let f be a function from a region take away z0, the, the implication is always that z0 uh, is in omega. Let's put it that way. And of course, as usual, omega is open and connected. Okay. So I'm speaking of 
this is some region omega, and there's a point z0 that's removed from it. So it's missing a point. Let f be um, such a thing. Uh, then, then z0 is a singularity, an isolated, an isolated singularity. OK. There are three types of singularities. Removable. Do you mean that f is holomorphic or just I'm any sorry, function? Holomorphic. Thank you. If I have a holomorphic function everywhere except the point, it might be that the, that the singularity is removable. Uh, z times 1 plus z over 1 plus z has a removable singularity, has removable singularity at z equals negative 1. As written, it's not defined at negative 1. But of course, I can cross out the top and bottom and replace it by the function z and plug in the one value, make it equal to negative 1 at negative 1. So i.e., let's, let's leave a little room, i.e., there exists a function g from all of omega to c, which is holomorphic. And g restricted to the domain of f is identically equal to f. Okay, removable singularity means it, it's, you're stupid for missing this point. It just, this, this, it's not a problem. Fill it in. Okay. Um, there are two. There are two more singularities, and these we really have to talk about. One is called a pole, and one is called an essential singularity. Actually, this is pretty easy to to, to describe. Here's what it means for for a function to have a pole. So f has a pole at z0 if when you graph the wave we even so here's omega down here and here's z0 the graph has a pole in every direction it's shooting up i.e. if 1 over f has a removable singularity at z0 equal to 0. And when you remove the singularity, the correct value to place is 0. So the function is blowing up in every direction. That is what it means to be a pole. And then if it's neither removable nor a pole, then it's called essential. Essential is other. OK, and the thing you should have in mind, so of course, an example of a function with a pole, f of z equals 1 over z has a pole at 0. So example, because 1 over f is z but not at 0, is z or undefined at z equals 0, at z not equal to 0, which is obviously a removable singularity. You should fill it in with the value 0. Mitchell. Uh, I was to, so this might be a very stupid question, but what is the limit as z goes to 0 of 1 over z? What is the limit as z goes to 0 of 1 over z? The limit doesn't exist. It's a pole. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the limit doesn't exist because it goes to infinity at different directions. It's going to. Yeah, but I, I guess my question, maybe to clarify, is that with complex numbers, like we treat like there's like one complex infinity or something yeah. like this. Yes. But then, like, like, why is it that in like real numbers, like we would say, oh, it goes to plus infinity or minus infinity, and we treat these? We're not like, thinking about it the right way. Okay. I mean, yeah. Life becomes so much better when you projectivize. Okay. So the so the real line shouldn't have a plus infinity and a minus infinity. They should they should. Come okay. Together. We should compactify it. Okay. We should compactify. It. Yeah. Projectivize, um, which which over the complex numbers happens very very naturally. So we're going to get to uh, the Riemann sphere point of view. Um. It's eleven. Should we take a break? I think this is a good 
it's a good spot to take a break. We're, we're about to start some, some things where we need to think. So we have some definitions. Uh, what's an, give me one example of an essential singularity. What's like the prototype? Kailash? One over sine z. One over sine z, great. One over sine z um, will accomplish something very similar to e to the one over z. It'll have a okay. similar feature to e uh, to the one over z. The point is, as z goes to zero, so let's think about the graph of e to the one over z. As z goes to zero from the right, see, now, now I'm going to contradict what I said to Mitchell. As z goes to zero from the right, one over z is going to positive infinity, and e to the positive infinity is blowing up. So in this direction, it's blowing up. F goes to infinity. As z goes to zero from the left from negative, one over negative in, one over negative zero is negative infinity. E to the minus infinity, f is going to zero. And how about uh, as z if z is equal to i t? and t is going to zero. I'm coming in from the imaginary direction. Yeah, it's spinning. The absolute value of f is one. Okay, so it's doing some kind of spinny thing, but the absolute value is one. So it just has no limit at all. In one direction, it's blowing up. In another direction, it's going to zero. In another direction, it's staying at one. And we're going to prove some fancy theorems about what happens to essential singularities. But this is not a pole because one over this function is not going to zero. one over f has no removable singularity is not is not going to zero all right any questions let's take uh five come back at 10 after okay so um let's discuss let's discuss zeros 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 um, so theorem, if f, now holomorphic, now we're really talking about holomorphic functions basically all the time, has a zero at z zero, then there exists a neighborhood of u, there exists a holomorphic function holomorphic non-vanishing function, and there exists a unique number capital N, so that for all z in this neighborhood, f of z is z minus z0 to the n times g of z. There are all kinds of ways real analytic functions can vanish. Uh, real the real smooth functions can vanish. But holomorphic functions can only vanish at polynomial rates. Okay. Well, um, I always mean, do I have to say explicitly that f is not the everywhere zero function? I don't have to say that explicitly, right? f is not identically the zero function. There, I've said it explicitly. Okay, proof. First of all, why is z0 isolated, an isolated zero? Analytic continuation. Analytic continuation, yes. So since f is not identically zero, z0 is isolated. I.e., there exists some neighborhood that contains z0 such that f uh, of z equals 0 in u implies z is z0. This is, a, this is a stupid way of saying the only place it vanishes in u is at z0. I.e., I.e., -E, f doesn't equal 0 in u except at z0. 
Okay. F, um, I can assume Z0 is a disk, or Z0 is contained in a disk where, where F is uh, holomorphic. Let's say this is contained in a disk of radius R about Z0 by choosing the neighborhood. Okay. There exists a function uh, except Z0. F is holomorphic on the disk, which means it's analytic in the disk. Um, F of Z, so for all Z in U, F of Z is equal to some A N Z minus Z0 to the N. This is an analyticity. And let capital N be the least little n such that a n is not zero. Okay. Why does it exist? If all the a n's are zero, Okay, so what do we know about f? f of z is equal to, there's a z minus, so this, in other words, this, this starts at n, at least capital N. So I can pull out a factor of z minus z0 to the capital N. And then I have um, a n, a capital N, which is not zero, plus all the other terms a n plus one, z minus z zero plus a n plus two, z minus z zero squared, and so on. And this is what I will call g. And g is a convergent power series, hence analytic, hence holomorphic. because all we've done with the coefficients is shifted them by a finite amount. That doesn't change the Hadamard formula for the radius of convergence. And um, what we have to argue now is how do we know that G doesn't vanish at Z zero? A n is not zero. A n is not zero. So what we know is that G is continuous and G goes to A n as Z goes to Z zero and A n is not zero. So for all Z in possibly some smaller neighborhood, I, I, I can shrink the neighborhood as, as much as I need to in, in some smaller neighborhood, um, the absolute value of G is at least, let's say, a n over two. Why do we need to use the continuity? I'm just saying, as Z goes to Z zero, G goes to a n. Okay. I mean, its limit is non-zero, so there's a neighborhood around around which its value is not just non-zero but bounded away from zero. So that's it. G doesn't vanish implies G does not vanish on U, on U. So F is some power of Z times a non-vanishing function. Okay, this is like a structure theorem for zeros. If a function vanishes, the way that it does so is there's a factor of Z minus Z zero to some power, to some integer power, that's the rate at which it vanishes times a holomorphic function which doesn't vanish in a neighborhood. Ishan, something you don't like? No, it's okay. Hannah, it's okay. okay. We have to show that capital N is unique, right? Or is that Yes, it? thank you. Thank you. I didn't prove uniqueness. So now let's say, so we need uniqueness. Is it unique? 
say n1 is greater than n2 and f can be represented as z minus z0 to the n1 g1 and it can also be represented as z to the z0 z minus z0 to the n2 times g2 and neither g1 or g2 vanish and g1 g2 are non-vanishing Well, n1 was the bigger one. So let's, let's divide both sides by, in other words, z minus z0 to the n1 minus n2 times g1 is equal to g2. And this goes to 0 as z goes to z0. But g2 is not supposed to vanish. Contradiction. Is the function g also unique? I guess not. The function g is also unique because once n is unique, then f over this has a removable singularity, and that removable singularity is g. And so g1 agrees with any other potential g2. And they agree on a little disk, so by analytic continuation, it's unique. If it exists anywhere, it's, it, it exists wherever either is defined. And G is unique, by the way. But that's just analytic continuation. So this allows us to define definition if F, which is holomorphic and not, not entirely zero, vanishes at Z zero. And F can be written as this times G, which doesn't vanish near z0, then this number n is called the order of the pole, or order of the zero, order of the zero. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, if n equals one, Z zero is a simple zero of F. So if I say a function has a simple zero, it means to van it vanishes to first order. Okay. Let's do the structure theorem of poles. Structure theorem of poles. If F is holomorphic and has a pole at Z0. Again, that means one over F has a removable singularity, which is equal to zero. One over F equals zero at Z0 will be my shorthand for there's another function whose value is, you can extend the value of the function one over F near zero to, by setting it equal to zero and that'll be holomorphic. Um, if F is holomorphic and has a pole at Z zero, then there exists a neighborhood containing Z zero. There exists a function G defined at Z, on, on you, on all of you which is non-zero, and there exists a unique integer n such that for all z in your neighborhood, f of z can be expressed as z minus z0 to the minus n times g. The way you have a pole is there's a factor of z minus z0 to the n in the denominator, and then a function that's perfectly, that has a perfect removable singularity at z0. Okay, does that make sense? 
The proof, well, we said that one over F has a zero. By our structure theorem, one over F after continuing is uniquely expressible as Z minus Z zero to the N times some function G, which is non-zero in a neighborhood. Well, that's it. And G was well-defined, so its reciprocal is non-zero. G was non-zero, so it has a reciprocal. G had no poles, so its reciprocal is non-zero. And again, N is the order of the pole at Z zero and N equals one implies a simple pole. Any questions? All make sense? are still writing. Do I write too fast? No. You don't have to write as fast as me. Take your time. I hope you write less sloppily. Okay. All right, let's continue the structure theorem. Let's uh, get the Laurent series expansion near a pole um, theorem. This is the Well, this is really called the principal, principal part of expansion. That's the terminology, principal part expansion. Um, if F has a pole at Z zero, of order n, then near z0, f of z is equal to a minus n over z0, z minus z0 to the n plus a minus n plus 1 over z minus z0 to the n minus 1 down to a minus 1 over z minus z0 plus a function G, which is holomorphic on the entire neighborhood. And this is called the principal part. Why is this true? I'm still writing too fast. Just write it down from the previous theorem? Just write it down from the previous theorem. The previous theorem says we have one over z minus z zero to the n times something holomorphic. But something holomorphic can be expressed as a zero plus a one z minus z zero plus a two z minus z zero squared and so on. So just rename the terms. Okay. And now here is a very important definition, a very key. It turns out one of these numbers 
turns out to be the only thing that matters in the entire theory. And everybody that knows what I'm referring to, definition, um, this number right here, what color? I got to make this like hot pink or something. This number right here is the entire theory. A minus one is called the residue of F at Z zero. So this last term of the principal part is the key thing. I don't know if we're going to see today why it's the key thing. Maybe. Isn't that clear because it's the only, like the, this is the only term in f of z that's not polymorphic itself? Uh, I mean, what do you mean? I, wouldn't you think a minus n would be the thing that's most important or a zero? I don't know. Well, I'm just like thinking that maybe these like, depending on what n is, like these guys all have the primitive near c zero. That's because you've seen this before. <laughs> you're right. You're right. You can, uh, you can guess primitives for all of these. You're absolutely right. The, the reason you should suspect something fishy I and mean, this is all extremely closely tied to the complex logarithm. The issue of defining a complex logarithm and branch cuts and all this stuff. These have nice antiderivatives that you can write down, right? Let's, let's make this remark. Remark, the power function z to the n uh, for all n in z except minus 1 has a nice primitive. Is that what you mean, Mitchell? Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, I guess yeah. It's not obvious because like you don't know about the log. Like you don't know that the logarithm doesn't really make sense. Yeah. So much in this case. A function one over even over the real variables. Think about calc one. Every polynomial has a nice uh, antiderivative except one over z. All of a sudden you got log. So that that plays an absolutely critical essential role in complex numbers. But for like negative values, the primitive won't be well defined, right? Like if n plus one is negative, near um, z zero. Well, it, um, how should I put this? You're right that the, that the primitive still has a pole. It's not holomorphic. But it turns out that there's absolutely no um, issue with things like Cauchy's theorem. When you integrate, it'll turn out, I'm giving away a lot of the secrets, but it'll turn out that when you integrate all of these over circles, they still vanish. We did that on our homework, didn't we? You did. I, 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 I must admit, I don't look that closely at your homework. I, I realized after I looked last week that I did two of your problems for you by accident. Is that, is that right? At least. So uh, I don't remember what's on your homework, but you'll, you'll tell me. Yes, that was on your homework, that all of these integrals vanish just like all of these integrals vanish. And this is the only one that contributes something. So it's a, it's a very fundamental thing. So it'll be very important to be able to have a formula. You can't just say, take your F, well, and expand it. How do you expand it? How do you get to this? How do you pick off how how to pick off a negative one from f. All right, so we need a theorem. Um, let me write this out. Theorem, the residue of f at z zero is equal to something, and then let's prove it. So f, again, is a, we know the formula. It's a uh, z0 plus z to the n plus a negative 1 over z0 minus z0, z minus z0 plus a0 plus a1 z minus z0 and higher order terms. So there's your function. If you have not seen this before, how would you, how would you get to this 
term and this term only? What would you have to do to this function? Well, let's try some things. Um, we can't send z to z0 because we have things that are blowing up. So why don't we first do something that stops this blow up? So let's multiply by z. Let's multiply both sides. Let me do it over here. Let's multiply both sides by z minus z0 to the n. You have to know what the order of the pole is before you can pick off the residue. Okay, so now I have a minus n plus a minus 2 times z minus z0 to the n minus 2 and a minus 1 times z minus z0 to the n minus 1 and a 0 times z minus z0 to the n and higher order terms. How do I get rid of lower order terms? Now I have a polynomial. I mean, it's, it's an infinite uh, power series, but how do I get, get rid of those first couple of terms? What's a nice operation that kills lower order terms? Taking that derivative. Yes, Anna. Awesome. So if I take the derivative, ddz, ddz will kill the first term and take everybody else down by a power. So Anna, how many derivatives do I want to take? Um, you want to get down to, so n minus 1. I want to take n minus 1 derivatives. I want to take n minus 1 derivatives. And when I take those n minus 1 derivatives, all of these terms are gone. What happens when I take n minus 1 derivatives of this? The first derivative brings down an n minus 1. The next one brings down an n minus 2. Next one brings down an n minus 3. You have n minus 1 factorial. Exactly. This turns into n minus 1 factorial. And then I have stuff that, that's here to higher power. I still have z minus z0 to some power here, starting at the first power, times some, times some uh, partial factorial or whatever, times some stuff. So Anna, how would I get rid of this tail? Um, you take the value at z naught. Exactly. Exactly. You take the limit. So that's the formula for the residue. The formula for the residue is you take your function f, you multiply by z minus z0 to the power n, where n is the order. Then you take this function and you differentiate it n minus 1 times. What you'll get is n factorial times the thing that you want. So let's divide, uh, sorry, n minus 1 factorial. Let's divide by n minus 1 factorial. And let's take that whole function and evaluate it in the limit as z goes to z0. And that is the formula for the residue. A crucial, crucial formula. Okay. Um, I don't have time. I think this is a good place to stop for today. Questions? Ishan. Sorry. Um, so is there a way to do this if you don't know what the um, order is or if oh. the order is infinite? 
if and if you need it then so the order can we be, will need it the order can't be infinite uh, there is a procedure which is try this for n equals one so first of all look at your function if it blows up try it for n equals one and if it doesn't work you see if you were off if you chose a different n, then you would either, if you chose an n that's too high, you've differentiated too many times, and the limit as, uh, as z goes to 0 will give you uh, some finites. I mean, this will go to 0 if you've missed the order, if you differentiate too many times. And if you differentiate too few times, it'll blow up. So there's, like, there's a perfect sweet spot where, so what you should do, if you know that your function is blowing up, you start with, you start with uh, n equals one and try it. And if it still blows up, you try it with n equals two and so on. I was thinking more uh, when we, so I know that for essential singularities, the series to the left will go also to infinity, I think. I'm pretty sure, yeah. Um, for example, e to the one over z does that. Um, yes. I was wondering uh, if there's another way to get at, uh, a1, which is ambivalent to which case we're working in. No, this is really a theory that's, um, we're going to discuss essential singularities, but so much of the theory uh, involves studying functions that do not have essential singularities. So there's a special name that I should have told you, which is that a function, so f, so here's definition, it's so central it has its own term. If a function is holomorphic except for a bunch of points, which could be infinitely many points. They can't have a limit point. Um, it has poles, has poles at z0, z1, etc. Then f is called meromorphic instead of holomorphic, meromorphic. Okay, so the, the setting of meromorphic functions is uh, the, the vast, a much larger study of, of what happens to complex analytic functions. If they have a singularity, we want them to have poles, not essential singularities. Although when they have essential singularities, there's a lot more we could say also. We'll get to Picard and, and things like this. Is it still true that the integral of a circle around an essential singularity is the a sub one term or a sub negative one term? So try, try e to the minus one over z. That's, okay, that's, well. that's your exercise. So this is Ishan's exercise, but you guys are welcome to do it too. Exercise, integral e to the one over z dz over the unit circle. Play with it. What comes out? This is for fun, except for Ishan. Ishan, you have to hand this in. Wait, I shouldn't punish people for asking questions. It's not a punishment, right? It's, it's also just for fun. But okay, really cool. I don't mind turning it in. That's fine. But I don't think the creator will be particularly happy. <laughs> All right, guys.